On this episode of Virtual Sentiments, I talked to James Goodrich, an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This episode complements our earlier episode with Christopher Coyne on surveillance capitalism. But rather than focusing on surveillance or privacy, Jimmy is particularly concerned with companies' abilities to exclude users from their own data and how this can be seen as a form of arbitrary power, especially when using the neo-Republican conception of liberty as non-domination. We'll get into all that in the episode. But I just want to frame this by saying that thinking about property rights as a bundle, as we do in this conversation, and questioning whether platforms have not only the right to use, but also the right to exclude users from data, can help us tackle accusations of platforms as stealing from or exploiting their users, and also help us consider alternative forms of data governance like open data. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation as much as I liked talking to Jimmy. Thanks for talking to us today. Thank you so much. That was the uh, kindest introduction I think I've ever received. We're friends through doing the Smith Fellowship. And so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And I, if I wasn't giving you a kind introduction, then I wouldn't have been a very good friend. So, <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited too. Yeah, let's get into it. I, I, I do want to, so there's like so much that we can talk about today. And what I think is really cool about your work is that And I mean, I guess, you know, I'm a political theorist, so I probably have some bias, but I love that you work with very deep normative thought, normative philosophy, and thinking about traditions like republicanism, um, but you're engaged with very concrete policy debates and issues in public discourse, especially things like data, because there is so much good work on data and especially kind of data as political economy, like the political economy of data. But, you know, it can be very difficult to kind of go back and forth between these kind of concrete policy debates and then also situating kind of the legal frameworks or the technical frameworks, the ethical frameworks, and connect, connecting them to kind of a broader political philosophy. So kind of to just get us started in that, I think it's good to maybe start with the concrete. So, you know, what are some of the concerns about data today about big data firms that we see both in public discourse or that legal scholars talk about, that philosophers talk about, and sort of how do you situate what you're focused on in that kind of broader landscape of ideas? Great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I should say, you know, it's difficult to do the thing you described well, right? So it's maybe not difficult to like try and do it. And, you know, well, you do it well. So (laughs) yeah, I don't know. Remains to be seen. But um, I I take it that there are tons and tons of worries one may have. And I think very often people sort of uh, lump a lot of things together. So I like to keep a pretty firm distinction between what's going on in certain debates about AI and what's going on in certain debates about, say, data and data collection, the role of, say, data in society. So, of course, data is used with algorithms, but some of the sort of classic problems, classic may be strong, it's early days in some sense, are not exactly the same as some of the problems that arise with data. So many people are familiar with worries about algorithmic bias. So algorithms can sometimes produce results that strike us as inequitable, racist, sexist, and so on. Those are not the kinds of problems, for the most part, I'm concerned with. I mean, I'm worried about them, I should say, (laughs) but it's not the focus of the research. But when it comes to focusing on data, the sort of things we use to feed these algorithms, there are many concerns. People naturally have concerns with, say, privacy. So this is sort of the storage and maintaining of that data. There's other concerns with how the data is sort of collected, namely whether many, many large data firms might be manipulative in how they gather this data. So there's, of course, a famous Netflix documentary, which centers discussions of the attention economy, which might be a buzzword people are familiar with. 
But the idea is they're doing things to, say, get you something like addicted to various online platforms so that you might be able to, so they might be able to gather more data, provide uh, better spots to the advertisers, so on and so forth, make more money in this kind of way. That's a that's a different concern still. The concerns that sort of got me started in this field were the concerns that there's something exploitative or something akin to theft going on here. So I think the basic intuition is, look, so many big firms we can name these days, big, powerful firms, uh, Alphabet, Meta, and so on, it looks like, yeah, they're free to users, but then they use all of this stuff the users are producing, not their employees. Their employees aren't producing this stuff. The users are, and then they're getting rich off of it. Isn't that kind of weird? Shouldn't something be owed back to all these people producing the data? So I think when you try and dig in, it's actually really, really hard to completely make sense of that worry. I I mean, I still feel it intuitively to this day, but I, I can't myself entirely make sense of it, which is the source of some of the work. But it did get me thinking in general about um, some issues related to theft and exploitation, like property rights. So property rights over data. And that got me into thinking about larger issues of markets and data and led me to various concerns with the sexy topic of antitrust. So there are these days a kind of antitrust movement, uh, a somewhat prominent one. So some people call it the new Brandeis movement or the neo Brandeisian movement or pejoratively called hipster antitrust. The label didn't stick, I think, because it sounded too cool. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, yeah. I think it was the wrong one to throw around as an insult. Um, so kind of, it seems like it died down a little bit. But, you know, one of the figures in this kind of movement is now the head of the Federal Trade Commission. So there's some influence here. And the head of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, has critiques of um, some standard stuff in antitrust law, which of course is not the most exciting topic to everybody. But these critiques or criticisms are sort of motivated in part by how large data collecting firms use data and the role of data in the market. So a lot of my work is now sort of around trying to make philosophical or normative sense of what kinds of concerns there might be from an antitrust perspective or a perspective of you know what we might call market morality about the use and collection of data in society. No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think kind of digging into that a little more deeply too is that there's sort of this larger, always endearing, um, and you know, I, I personally think it's a good thing. I think society should always have kind of critique um, as a part of its discourses. Um, And so one of the major enduring critiques of our time is also critiques of capitalism. And so when we think about that, sometimes it seems like people are criticizing capitalism and they'll put it in terms of criticizing markets, that that markets are inherently exploitative or, or something like that. But I think then kind of well, what exactly is the claim? Is it actually markets or is it something that you've you've said too about markets are themselves shaped by the property regimes that we have both kind of um, instituted through law and convention? So yeah, would you like just expand a little bit about that and sort of so situating the kind of data issues uh, and data markets with a sort of broader kind of view of, of markets, you know, beyond data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So when you think about problem, you know, I guess at least when philosophers think about problems with some set of political or economic institutions, we like to get uh, annoyingly precise about like what exactly these things are, right? So what what is capitalism? I actually start my business ethics class by asking uh, my business students what capitalism is. This, of course, is a trick. None of them can give a very good definition of it. They can't give a very good definition of socialism. And of course, I'm trying to illustrate for them that this is all a little bit trickier than you maybe think. So there's a nice sort of definition I borrow from uh, the late Gerald Gauss. So Gauss like nicely, I think, gives a nice definition of like what capitalism is. 
instead of trying to define it as an actually existing institution, he defines it as a kind of ideal that we might strive towards if you're interested in striving towards it. And it has a few parts. One is sort of maximally extensive markets for the production and provision of goods and services in society. Um, One is uh, maximally extensive private property. So you sort of divide as many goods as you can into as much private property as you can. Another part is the hierarchical organization of firms. So firms should be organized with kind of a CEO at the top uh, or other board members, some middle management all the way down in a kind of pyramid structure. There's then sort of questions about how other things fit in with this, right? How does a social safety net fit in? So on and so forth. I I think this is like a nice serviceable kind of definition of what an ideal of capitalism is. But notice that you could object to many different parts of this and then count as objecting to capitalism. So very often people, I think in public discourse, will sit there and say, you know, people are being overly pro-market here or whatever else, where sometimes I think it's property rights that are the problem, or many people demand workplace democracy. It's a huge call among socialists these days to call for workplace democracy. But notice that at least in this kind of overly idealized philosophical schema, you could be totally happy with tons of private property and tons of extensive markets while having a very democratically ordered firm. So I think it's helpful to like tease these things apart conceptually. Now, once we hit the real world, these things are entangled in interesting ways. Um, one nice thing, or one thing I like about uh, this is this kind of approach is once you think about the real world, you'll see that it's very difficult to sort of maximize private property and markets at the same time. Um, so if voluntary exchange driven, you know, innovation is what you care about the most, sometimes private property gets in the way. People hold on to patents. And when they hold on to these patents, they're unwilling to, for example, uh, sell any uh, intellectual property that is protected by these patents. And this slows down innovation. So that's just kind of an obvious case in which private property sometimes gets in the way of a kind of market. So this is all just to say, I think I think it's important to start getting down in the weeds about potential conflicts between private property, for example, and markets. That's not to say that we need to maximize either one. It's just to say that recognizing that these tensions exist and that there's potential trade-offs to be made is, I think, an important task, even if one does not like the ideal of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's I think that's excellent. Um, those are really good points. And I think especially so the intellectual property question and then, you know, gets us into that focusing in on, OK, what are the nature of the property rights frameworks that we see are what are the kind of from various standpoints about what we are interested in, to what extent do they lead to or encourage or discourage those features? And so Let's oh, let's kind of switch back to the data question then. So what are some concerns for both kind of, or, or not concerns, but what are some important factors for how we think about how data is currently kind of defined in terms of property rights versus kind of what you're working on in your work or other people have proposed for ways that we might reconsider our kind of property regimes? No, no, no. Yeah, of course. I I guess the way I I tend to think about my own work is as concerned with the kinds of justifications people offer for, say, um, treating some good, for example, some object as private property. So there are, you know, as you as you well know, many justifications people offer historically for these kinds of things, and as you, I'm sure could better explain than I could. One thing that's interesting about so many of these justifications is many of them, their basic form comes like even before the industrial revolution. I mean, they're highly focused, especially on like land. So if your sort of archetypical object of property is land, that might lead you to formulate certain kinds of justifications for private property that look bizarre in other kinds of cases. So I think data is 
very unlike land. I hope that's not a like controversial claim. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. <laughs> it's one of those things that that calls for at least an examination to see whether the kinds of justifications of property work out there as well. Uh, maybe to like quickly add one other wrinkle to this all is I'm at least very attracted to the view that strictly speaking, like there's no such thing as private property. What there is is a bundle of distinct property rights. There's the right to use something. There's a right to make a profit from something. There's a right to exclude others from using something. That's one I think is really important. We might get into that in a second. But this is really just a familiar fact of life. So, you know, we were talking before the podcast began about uh, moving apartments. You know, I rent my apartment as well. I have certain rights that the landlord cannot violate in virtue of renting that apartment. They can't just barge in whenever they like, for example. I can use it for some purposes, though I signed a lease that said I can't have like parties after 11 p.m. or something like that, right? So even in these contracts, and contracts all the time, we're used to doling out some property-like rights over the apartment and not others. Others still sit with the landlord. They can decide whether to sell it. I cannot but I can actually prevent my landlord from entering the space. I can exclude them under at least many conditions. And so which one of us owns the uh, apartment? I don't know. It's not a very interesting question, right? I mean, I think the better way to look at it is I have some rights over it, at least right now. They have some rights over it. Um, many of the rights originate with them, but you know what? The bank might have given them quite a large loan. Uh, and so that might, in some sense, the bank might own the building. So the whole thing, I think, is um, it's sometimes misleading even to just talk about private property. So we need to, I, on top of looking at different justifications for private property, say when it comes to data, I think we actually need to go through and look at the justification of each sort of property-like right, the right to use and profit and exclude sort of one by one to see if it's justified in, say, the case of data or intellectual property or anything else. Yeah, no, th those are good points. And and a part of, uh, you know, and th th this is sort of a proposal. So to what extent are figuring out those rights um, sort of, yeah, the way that you started that sort of comparing land and data, these are fundamentally different things. So a kind of property, a kind of way of understanding property rights that's based on land might not really match with data. And because this is what's interesting is like, I, I've often thought about like, do philosophers, do political theorists, do economists think about things like public goods, private goods differently? Or how much do we actually uh, overlap? Um, and part of it is also when I think about are there kind of inherent features to a technology, let's say, or to a good sort of technological facts that render something more feasible as uh, or something that could be better, better understood or used through a certain property regime. So I guess what I'm thinking of is we talked a little bit about this, but, you know, and hopefully I'll be able to talk about this in other episodes, but the idea that data is also very relational. So um, it's kind of produced by people so even if you think of it in an individual way, it's still produced by, you know, an individual using a, a computer mediated application of some kind, that kind of thing. I mean, there's other ways of collecting data, but if we're talking about the kind of behavioral data that people are interested with online companies, but then there's also, of course, that data that's collected about my friend actually ends up collecting data that relates to me. So we have these kind of fundamentally networked or relational kind of aspects of data. So does that mean that there's sort of an inherent kind of politics to the technology itself? Or is that something that we can also control to some degree with the kind of rights that we uh, define? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So there's a there's a great example that's been put to me before. I can't rem remember now actually where, where it originates, but you could have, you know, it, it, it might seem initially like puzzling to think, uh, say, I would own my data for like the following reason, which is that here's a fact about me. My mother is who my mother is, you know, fill in her name here. And under that description, right? Uh, and then there's like another kind of fact, Jimmy's mother's birthday is whenever it is, right? You might, it's difficult to, I mean, maybe this is a fact about me, namely, I'm the kind of person who has a mother born at this time. And I'm the kind of person who has a mother who's that particular person. So if, for example, I consent to, 
you know, some online platform having my data. Uh, from that, it's very easy for them to infer my mother's birthday, like some fact about my mother that you might think is, you know, not mine to give away in some sense. So that's like one kind of relational fact. Uh, maybe that one's a little bit cheesy, but it has like some like it gets at, I think, at least one kind of relation, which is like, how do we even begin to like define which thing is about me rather than other people? That's like one kind of trickiness already. Another kind of thing is like maybe you and I have some kind of direct like interaction on on some platform you know so who owns that do we jointly own it i mean some of these things seem really like sort of puzzling i guess i would think that i'd be surprised if there's like a deep metaphysical answer to any of these things like we're gonna find some really deep fact that could be derived from like a a so-called natural rights theory so a, a theory of how we come to have property rights over things that could like give us a clear answer in any of these cases. It just doesn't seem to be the right kind of tool. I do think maybe we could come up with some legal rules for how to adjudicate these things if we really wanted to. If we decided it was a really good idea to try and separate these things out so that different people had different you know, kinds of individual property rights over this information, we could try and figure out some legal rule for doing this Whether there's like a nice clean set of them, I don't know. These would probably be rough and ready and it would have to be justified largely in virtue of the consequences of those legal rules. So those would be kind of conventional property rights. In that sense too, it looks probably pretty political, right? We're going to have to justify these rules to like individuals and say, you know, they should be the result of a democratic process. They should be the kinds of things that are acceptable to everybody or to most people, at least. Yeah. And so I don't know how you, you, it seems essentially political if you're going to start dividing up data in that way. Yeah. No, excellent. No, those are good points. And so getting back to um, kind of one of the different rights among the bundle of rights that you described and what is kind of central to your work, uh, some of your work, is this notion of the right to excludability. So, and we can kind of contextualize that a little bit more with, so what I think is interesting is that one of the arguments that you're doing when you're working on this new antitrust movement, this neo-Brandeisian movement, is that you actually, you know, it's interesting because I guess I can definitely see there are some people who probably have, I mean, I know there are people who have extremely strong opinions about you know, the consumer welfare standard is the way that we should think about antitrust policy and that this new movement is a, you know, hyper political or, you know, some sort of radically kind of challenging approach. And not that, no, I don't want to under, I don't want to underestimate its differences, but what you kind of start from with your work or I, I, I see it as highlighting the sort of commonalities to the approaches in terms of, you know, they think that there are valuable benefits to markets, including market competition. And so what are those kind of normative claims underscoring those different standards? And so, you know, it seems like the consumer welfare standard doesn't grapple with a certain amount of issues. uh, And and is that still something that if we are committed to certain benefits of markets that we should be concerned with the fact that it doesn't grapple with those issues? Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, uh, sometimes I think with political disagreements, people think that, oh, people have totally different moral values, but in uh, reality, they might actually share a lot of values and have kind of different ways of understanding uh, a certain case or a certain problem. So I guess, would you mind kind of diving into that a little bit more uh, in terms of kind of what's at stake here in these debates and thinking about markets? And then why is the kind of issue of excludability such a kind of central part of understanding the normative vision that people like like Khan might have for uh, antitrust? Right. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so there's there, there's sort of so much to say here. We might have to break it up a little bit, I think. Um, so, I mean, maybe maybe to quickly speak first to the um, consumer welfare standard point just a little bit. This is, you know, a, a very popular standard. Basically, it says, you know, there's something objectionable if and only if, something objectionable by the lights of what we might call market morality if and only if some behavior of a firm makes consumers worse off. And then there's a little bit of uh, hedging to understand exactly what that means. So worse off as consumers, obviously, since 
consumers themselves may also be competitors, but we're not supposed to care about the well-being of competitors. But, you know, of course, there aren't two kinds of human beings, consumers and competitors. That's, you know, a bit of an odd way to phrase it. And, you know, there are things to say in favor of this. I think the main defense is that it seems to give somewhat clear guidance as far as far as anything in the law does as a kind of precedent or standard. Of course, there's, you know, iterations of debates about precise interpretations and what kind of evidential standards we must use in order to determine what fulfills the standard or not. I should also maybe before I move on, I just realized I should flag that I, I phrase this in terms of morality of the market. That's, of course, not how defenders of the consumer welfare standard usually paint it. It's usually thought of as purely a legal standard. However, we might want to use, we might use a different word here. Something only counts as anti-competitive, if and only if it harms consumers, right? And then we have to figure out why we care about anti-competitiveness. And I think that is where we're going to get into moral and political philosophy really quickly, actually. But sort of to get back on the point, I think the main defense of the principle is like, okay, it captures some of what we care about. It seems to explain why monopolies are often bad. Namely, they seem to charge, they can charge these outrageous prices for goods and services. And that's a bad thing. You know, the market's no longer working if there's no competition, right? This harms consumers. So it it gives a straightforward explanation of why monopolies can be bad. And the other part, I think, is that it's reasonably clear and easy to apply where the challenge really for various competitors to the consumer welfare standard has been, it it looks a little bit too, many look too easy to kind of morph into whatever you want. They can be sort of manipulated. The interpretation of it can be too easily manipulated for political purposes. And so the thought is we shouldn't start, you know, policing markets if really what we're doing is something that should be a matter of legislation, namely, you know, trying to revamp voting systems or whatever else the case may be. And I should also say that I think some of the neo-Brandeisians don't always do themselves favors along these lines. You know, I think occasionally they could be clearer about what falls under their criticism of the consumer welfare standard versus what might just be a different general point they're making about markets or why we should be worried about monopolies. Sometimes these things aren't distinguished enough. And I think that sometimes invites criticisms of those objecting to the consumer welfare standard, but those may not be the fairest. So that's, that's, that's the broad thing. So, so why, might, why might you think that the consumer welfare standard is objectionable? Just to give like one quick example, one practical example, some are worried about what's called below cost pricing. So if you have a firm that has a lot of capital, a lot of money, they might be able to survive quite a long time without making a profit from a certain venture they're participating in. If they can take this hit long enough, they can provide this service for free, various benefits for free. None of their competitors can. So of course, they're going to, they're going to win out, right? Their service is free. Everyone else you got to pay for. Why would I ever do that? Then once all the competitors are gone, they can then sort of reap the benefits. They're the only ones left in the market. So this looks somewhat problematic, and yet it can be a little bit difficult for the consumer welfare standard to explain what's gone wrong here. Hey, how could consumers be harmed by a free service? Trying to show that, well, they might be harmed in the long run is really, really tricky to show. To show that the reason they're engaged in below cost pricing, for example, is to crowd, you know, to get other people to leave the market is kind of difficult to show, right? You know, you might cite things like, look, Google gives you an email account for free if you want it, right? But this might just be, you know, them relying on general kind of network effects. All right, I'm already signed up with Google for this and that, might as well do their email suite. And so it might sort of in some broader sense attract people to use Google services in general. And so it's not real, you know, it may not really look like they're trying to crowd out the market. They're just trying to get you to throw in everything you got on Google. One way to do that is for them to give you something for free that Strictly speaking, they maybe they take a hit on. I don't think that's true with Gmail, but you, you get the idea. So that's one kind of practice that maybe looks 
if if it's genuinely going on, looks difficult for the consumer welfare center to explain why this is bad or in any kind of usable way. So the kind of critique from the neo Brandeisians is typically something like, well, clearly what's going on is they have some amount of market power in virtue of all of this capital, and they're sort of using this to shape the structure of the market to make it very difficult for competition to occur, even if they're not directly harming consumers in doing so. And that we should think is objectionable. There's something anti-competitive about this. This has problematic in some kind of way. So then the kind of retort often is, okay, what's your alternative standard? We get the critique. What's the alternative standard? What's the if and only if here that can help us out? To which, for the most part, they the neo-Brandeisians haven't had a lot to offer. Now, one of the reasons they haven't offered quite a lot, according to, say, Khan, is that Part of what they're trying to do is a larger kind of critique of the way antitrust is understood. They think that much of the way antitrust is understood follows from a um, certain vision of liberal political philosophy that would have been uh, advocated for by the Chicago School. Um, And so that what they need to do is sort of push in new directions, sort of philosophically, they believe the phrase she uses is they need an alternative normative vision. And as far as I can tell, uh, there hasn't been much offering of a full-fledged alternative normative vision. Of course, you know, it's hard to blame them. Uh, Many of these people ended up in the Federal Trade Commission or advisors to Biden. So, you know, they hadn't had a lot of time to work out the alternative philosophical theory. And so some of my work is attempting to try and make sense of this. How how could we do this, whether or not you're going to end up buying the theory at the end of the day? What would this look like? And it's interesting because so one of the ways that you do that, and I guess I am curious, like, is it what well, well, what role d- did it play for you when you kind of looked back at because one of the things you cite in your work and kind of ground the argument that you're making is John Senator John Sherman's comments on the passing of the antitrust um, legislation. So you know, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm into history, you know, I'm trying to kind of get some more historical perspective into some of these debates. So kind of why, I I guess what I'm trying, I guess, you know, a cynical read on how we can use history is, you know, it's just rhetoric or something, right? So like rhetorically, it's really useful to be able to kind of trace something, but I don't think that that's what you're doing. And I don't think that that's, I think usually when people are are engaging with history, that's really not what they're trying to do. So kind of, how, it, it's just, it just plays a small role, like analytic philosophy. It's not, not as, uh, not as, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is because I negatively, not as like weighed down by or positively, you know, not as inspired by history, but uh, what role did it play kind of in, in, in your eyes and maybe more broadly, but also just uh, in this piece? Like, why should we be thinking about what Senator Sherman put, in, uh, how he put the the kind of way of thinking about these issues? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. Well, Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to say as much uh, about That's okay. history uh, as, <laughs> no, you, as no, you might I hope. Wasn't, I, um, I, okay. You'll, you'll see okay. why in a second, I think. Um, so, so one thing I should mention is this quote is sort of uh, not unpopular among critics. That's interesting. So it's actually, in a way, it's even if it's not necessarily super historical, but it is crucial to understanding what the critics are saying, right? I mean, it becomes a kind of guiding principle of sorts. So, Right. And there, there is a uh, strong historical sense in this school. I mean, so it's the new Brandeis, the neo-Brandeisian. So this is, of course, named for um, Brandeis, was a judge, I think, in, in scholar um, who, um, who, of course, wrote on antitrust. So it was, there is a historical sense here, which is, I should say the historical sense here that's sort of backing up part of the uh, uh, neo-Brandeisian movement is I think also part of what sometimes invites the attacks. There's a kind of uh, mythology of anti- the development of antitrust law. And there is uh, these bad old days where, okay, so like Sherman comes on the scene. The Sherman Act is the foundational sort of piece of law for antitrust law in the United States. And this is to correct, you know, for all kinds of monopolies that existed in the late late 19th century, early 20th century. And to some degree, I think people accept that this was a good thing. But then 
it was all rampant with abuse for a very long time before um, Robert Bork came along and saved us with his book, The Antitrust Paradox. That's maybe a little unfair, but that is very often the way that history is represented. Brandeis comes between Sherman and Bork, so therefore he's part of the bad old days. So this kind of feeds into the narrative of they want to return to some old bad standard, which of course is not what they're saying. But maybe it's worth reading out Sherman's quote. I do rather like it, and I'll explain why. So what Sherman said on the passing of the uh, uh, Sherman Act is, if we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation, and sale of any of the necessities of life. If we would not submit to an emperor, we should not submit to an autocrat of trade with the power to prevent competition. So, of course, this is casting things in terms of power. This, of course, was a key idea I mentioned a moment ago uh, among the Brandeisians, the Neo-Brandeisians. They want to think in terms of power. That's going to be important for how I approach things. But I think what actually I find attractive as an analytic philosopher is this like really, uh, I think, interesting, you might call reductive, I would call unifying idea here. Namely, there should be a single foundation, a single normative or moral foundation for our political and economic institutions. It would be utterly bizarre to think that whatever we don't like about dictatorships, for example, Whatever moral concern motivates that suddenly doesn't matter once a market's involved. We should have no concerns over that kind of thing. That would be a really, really weird way to look at the world. Why would something matter in one case, but not the other? That's a very like, again, you might think reductive, I think beautiful, unifying, simple kind of account. It, it's, got, it's got everything an analytic philosopher likes in it. It's just odd of the, in awe of the beauty of that mo- maneuver. And in, in my manuscript, I call it Sherman's Premise. Uh, so I, I quite like it uh, for that reason. Uh, I wish I could say more to the importance of looking at history here. And maybe I should go ahead and mention that there is some good work out there actually tracing out the history here and the connection between what's going on with Sherman up until contemporary uh, antitrust debates. Yeah. So the other, so like, okay, so thinking about this sort of normative vision too, and, you know, the idea of uh, why would we have a king in the market? Why would, we, why would we allow for kind of a king to dominate in the market versus in politics? And I, I can't help but, you know, feel that I need to voice the counter argument from a standpoint would be that, well, markets are f- an institution unto themselves. You know, what my understanding is, you know, very common understanding of monopolies now and why a, a retort to um, the Neo Brandeisians would be that the only kind of monopolies are those that are created through government privilege. So, the, what the market does is that, you know, to the extent that there are firms dominating, as long as they're doing so within the right. So, this is again, I think, a kind of an issue though, because there's still a legal framework. So, you know, assuming that you, if you assume the legal framework right now is fine and they're doing everything that's legal, then, you know, it's, it's a, consumers are ultimately sovereign in the market and influencing kind of which firms succeed. And so the firms that dominate are dominating because they're just doing it better, you know? So kind of what would be the response to that? Well, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. So I guess there's a there's a few things to say, right? So the the idea is, yeah, right. So the idea is like, even when there are seeming natural monopolies, monopolies that arise through the market, you know, one people cite sometimes is Coca-Cola for a long period of time, they do seem to eventually fall like empirically speaking. So Pepsi comes along, right? Oh, yeah. And that's a very common thing with tech now, too, because people will point to these kind of older tech companies that aren't as big anymore and say, well, you know, that's just these current companies are going to end up like them. So yeah. So I think I think maybe the main thing to say, and to keep in mind here is that uh, thinking all in only in terms of monopoly, it is misleading. What we should care about is violations of a kind of competitive ethos or something like that. Now that might come in the form of monopoly power. It might come in other forms. One reason to de-stress 
monopolies. Other than that, it's just very clearly not everything that antitrust law cares about. That's plain enough to see by the nature of the laws themselves, right? I mean, so collusion, for example, may not be monopoly power, but it is anti-competitive, right? So first things first, monopoly is one phenomenon under the umbrella of anti-competition. So it may not be the only one. I used to cast this work more in terms of monopoly, but this is one of the reasons I stopped doing so. Another one is that the concept of a monopoly is extremely unclear. So for example, you know, I, I forget now who originated it, but there's a kind of old joke, which is like, you know, take a list of all of the firms in a given market, draw a line under the first one. If there's anything below it, then there's no monopoly, right? Like that's the best we can do by telling you what a monopoly is. There's only one or something like that. So if that doesn't seem to be it, right? It's not as if there was literally no one else producing cola or some equivalent soft drink at the time of, uh, you know, Coke's major dominance. Okay, what is it exactly? I mean, we could start saying it's a 95% market share. Okay, or is it 93? So there's that kind of thing that just it all looks arbitrary. Another way it looks weird is it's hard to define markets, like a market in what exactly? So if I said, a market in cola in 1970 versus, say, a market in non-alcoholic beverages in that period, they look different. What's the principle that fully determine? I don't know, but and I doubt there's a fact of the matter. So I think sometimes some of this is misleading by the focus on monopoly, right? And I think to some degree, uh, the neo-Brandeisians should not be understood as being concerned with monopoly as such. You might say monopoly power, but I think what they mean there is maybe charitably read, maybe too charitably read, depending on who you talk to. Um, I think what they're primarily concerned with is power, which is in some way in violation of a kind of plausible market morality, something that seems anti-competitive in some sense. Well, and to connect this back to the property issue is that, you know, at least the way that I kind of think about some of this is that you know, it's good. I don't want to get us too far afield because what is so great, and I think it's good that philosophers get very precise about things. But I think one thing that's difficult is, okay, I think we can see people have a lot of, I think, fair concerns about behavioral data. And so one issue is that really fundamentally there, we can already see that we have a particular set of ways that we usually define rights of access to the data. And one of the things that you're talking about specifically is this excludability. So I, you know, also so I'd like for you to kind of go, go into detail about that, but just sort of kind of get to the point that I wanted to make in terms of the kind of monopoly debates is that ultimately, if these are the underlying legal regimes we have, it doesn't really, I don't, I'm kind of not convinced that we're going to innovate ourselves out of it um, in the market, because it's kind of broader structural incentives that are shaping what kind of companies uh, and what kind of business models are successful overall? I mean, so so maybe maybe there is some room, but I, I but again, if, if we start thinking just in terms of what you're thinking about in terms of these property rights, it seems to me like this might be something that's operating at a deeper uh, level that is going to kind of limit or encourage certain kinds of possibilities. So whatever companies replace. Alphabet and Facebook in 20 years, or Alphabet and Meta in 20 years, you know, are they going to be fundamentally that different in terms of the relationships that we have to data um, and our access to it or our way of the kind of transparency of what's done with data and things like that? Yeah, I think maybe one thing to point out, which I, I think builds on that too, is it, you know, if the complaint is, well, there's no natural monopolies, right? These are just monopolies that are derived from, say, government privilege. Well, the more sort of uh, power, say, that this behavioral data instills, the greater incentive there is to drive up money from it. I actually almost use the word profit, but maybe that's not right here. It could exactly it could be rent seeking, right? The greater there's incentive there's going to be for kinds of partnerships between these large firms and the government in order to maintain this power and to drive more money from it. So, I mean, the idea that this may end up being exact the the problem here may be exacerbated by you know government involvement or government partnerships with these companies is all fine and well by my lights i mean it may well be exacerbated exactly by it and so i think to come back around to your point is 
yeah, the the underlying concern here is about these more fundamental relationships, I think. And if you can't get those sort of right, if we can't figure those out in a way that maybe is fitting for a market society, then look, we're it's only going to make matters worse once we begin worrying about the public choice critiques and we start worrying about rent seeking. Things get that much worse, that much scarier. Yeah. So, so, but so to kind of get at to this idea of excludability. So, you know, one way that we can think about data right now is that, uh, and getting to the sort of classic, you know, often in public policy or various literatures, we have kind of a classic two by two where we think about goods in terms of are they rivalrous or subtractable, as in does somebody's use of it kind of make it less available for others and the other axis is excludable versus non-excludable. So how easy is it, how hard is it to kind of prevent others from accessing, from using the same stuff? So uh, what I think what's interesting is is your kind of turn to this right to exclude as a way of understanding the kind of anti-competitive actions that you are talking about, this kind of violations of a competitive ethos as being a way of understanding kind of domination in the market from from big data firms. Would you mind like expanding on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, maybe the central philosophical argument sort of attempting to develop here is that there is a way in which what I'll call big data firms, um, in a way, it might become clear what that means in, in a second as we sort of like move through a couple steps, end up dominating us in society. This is relevant to the Sherman point, I should say, because one explanation for why we might care about democracy over and above the extent to which it promotes our interests is there's something morally disvaluable about being under the arbitrary will of another being under the arbitrary will of even a benevolent dictator who does a pretty good job at meeting all of our uh, needs and satisfying all of our interests. So take that with the kind of Sherman premise that if that goes for the political institutions, it should go for the economic ones as if we could even divide these things up. But then the thought is maybe we should be concerned with domination in the marketplace. We should be worried about arbitrary power, the arbitrary subjugation to other people's wills. That sounds somewhat highfalutin. By arbitrary, I mean, there's various things people say here. I'll mean that power is arbitrary to the extent that it isn't forced to track the interests of other people. So really quickly, there's a lot of definitions, but I think it's helpful. (laughs) The idea here is that certain, say, legal regimes might force other people to track our interests, or at least not to be able to carry through on things that would violate our interests. So when the law ends up having a criminal statute that says, you know, you can't assault people, even if there's some way in which an individual sort of has the capability to do so, has this kind of power, these incentives in some sense force them to be able to act on that power, right? So it's the idea is it's trying to force people's behavior to track other people's interests and the failure to do so can become violations of freedom, namely battery or assault or whatever. Okay, so that's that's the rough notion of arbitrariness and so arbitrary power and the notion of domination. For the moment, I'll just skip how exactly I think that might be thought about in terms of a pricing mechanism. Uh, but I think there's interesting things to say there about how well-functioning prices may actually track our interests and therefore make any power in the marketplace less arbitrary. But once we take a step back, I think the right to exclude a particular kind of property, right, the right to prevent other people from using a given good is a source of power, first of all. And then there's a question about whether this power is arbitrary. In most cases, the answer is probably not that arbitrary. Okay, so, you know, and I link this up with what you were just mentioning a second ago, It's not that arbitrary because goods are often rivalrous. And this justifies giving me a right to exclude. So if I otherwise acquire a legitimate property right, however that's done, uh, to use 
say, an apple, right, to uh, own an orchard and use the apple as I grow from my trees, my power to my ability to exclude you from taking those apples and turning them into cider when I want to use them to make a pie is not arbitrary, right? It has the right kind of right to protection. There's a kind of justification for this right to exclude in this case where the good is rivalrous. Things become much trickier the second that the good is non-rivalrous. So when a good is non-rivalrous, multiple people can use it at the same time without it being used up or degraded in value, right? So data, at least to some extent, is less rivalrous than apples and land and so on. Multiple firms could use it at the same time, maybe for different results to different ends. And having a sort of more open access to data in this way may be to everyone's benefit. It may encourage greater innovations. Those may reduce transaction costs. That's one way to think about it. Another way that I sort of pump up is there, there may be great benefits to, I think, healthcare. One thing behavioral data is really, really good for is for studying the social and behavioral determinants of health, which is a widely understudied but extremely important dimension to determining health outcomes. So more or less here, you could just begin quoting a number of health researchers who say as much. Many have all noticed that platforms like uh, Facebook and Instagram, et cetera, may be really, really, really generative grounds for being able to collect huge amounts of behavioral data that could then be studied to uh, better understand various social relations and how those contribute to health. One sort of one that I think is interesting is uh, suicidal ideation among veterans. There was an attempt to study this that looked like it didn't go as far as it could have because they hit too many roadblocks in trying to actually acquire the data that is plausibly available on Facebook. There's actually an entire journal dedicated to trying to figure out how to do online health research. So this is just to say there's this data out there, behavioral data. It's really, really beneficial. It can be used for multiple purposes at the same time without degrading in value. And I think this makes it trickier to justify a property right in it, or the right to exclude, I should say. So maybe one last thing to say about this is this is where the bundle point comes back in. You might sort of be stamping your foot thinking, how dare you say such a thing, right? But you can maintain a right to profit without the right to exclude. So if you're thinking, well, look, they worked really hard to collect all of this data. They own the platform on which the data is created. It's relational in one of the senses that you brought up earlier. Shouldn't this entitle them to make money? We might think so. You know, we might think that's right. However, it's not clear in the case of a non-rivalrous good that the right to profit entails the right to exclude. So I could say more about that, but that's sort of the strategy is to argue that those things come apart in the case of behavioral data. And because of that, this um, power is going to count as arbitrary to some degree. And therefore, uh, large tech firms, at least some, I should say, it turns out there's so many caveats, I think, (laughs) along the way of when I try and develop the argument that maybe fewer end up under the target than anyone might have hoped or Maybe some of the neo-Brandeisians might have hoped, but some may end up counting as dominating us. And there's questions about what we do about that, of course. Maybe the answer is there's not much feasible we could do, but that strikes me as a compelling problem. No, and I think this that makes a lot of sense to me. And I I guess I don't want to get ahead of or go too far afield from what you're focused on. But I think in terms of people who might have other concerns distinct from the sort of way that we think about like market power data and like data in markets, I think what's so crucial about this is that we're sort of talking about, you know, inc- improving access to data. And there's a lot of different ways that that could be done. I mean, it could still be that you because it could be like a toll good or a club good where, you know, you pay for the access to some degree, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's totally open um, because after all, it is technically, I think this is why I think it's important to kind of talk about it because sometimes people will get into sort of something about like, oh, well, technically it's like, you know, it's not, ex- it's, it's not excludable, but you can exclude people from, I mean, we, that's how it, right, how it works right now. We, there is actual exclusion from access to the data. It's just that it's not rivalrous or yes, it's not rivalrous. So, you know, you don't have to exclude to still get use out of it. But 
then the question is sort of, okay, there's like kind of two full questions here. It's one, how do we think about like cases where we exclude cases where we don't, ex- don't exclude um, in terms of, you know, one of the examples to talk about in your paper, but this is also more kind of broadly when you think about intellectual property is, I think people have it uh, actually, you know, honestly, this is what like NFTs, I feel like were kind of designed or like supposed to be the answer to concerns about like, are artists getting credit for and, and, and earning money off of their art? But it's, you know, fundamentally, so why in some cases should there be sort of a, you know, a kind of exclusion, a rights exclusion, but then also separately, if we're talking about, let's say, providing, you know, academics, researchers, government researchers with, you know, large data sets from Alphabet, from Meta or something like that, changing laws in ways that make there be kind of increased access to data. How is that? I guess I, it seems to me I can already tell you can do that without allowing for various other things to be done. So, you know, this is Shana Zuboff critique of surveillance capitalism, but also beyond Shana Zuboff, the people who are concerned with AI algorithmic discrimination, but then also the way that sort of, okay, a social media platform might move your politics one way or the other because of what it's collecting about you and then fe- you know, targeting you with certain ideas. If that's like a concern, you know, why does kind of improving access to more actors, to more kind of social groups, like individuals to kind of create their own, you know, firms where they're not even necessarily making profit, but you could like create these different technologies using the data. Is that something that we should still be on the lookout for? Or is there something that this kind of changing of excludability just doesn't touch on that and that that's a whole separate problem or does it have implications for those problems for those concerns yeah so i guess to the first question which is sort of about well look you know clearly there's some cases of non-rivalrous goods where we're we think people do have the right to exclude you know i make a recording of a song at home i don't have to upload it anywhere i don't have to share it with the world this is you know it would be it would be absurd to claim that i did isn't aren't I excluding people, but look, it's non rivalrous, right? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a legitimate concern. I mean, I think there's a few things to say here. One is, I don't want to lose sight of privacy concerns entirely. So um, of course, any proposal that looks like it's hedging toward or moving toward more open access to data is going to have concerns about privacy, right? Now, those need to be accounted for. Now, there's questions about whether we can ever do this technologically or not, whether, you know, certain levels of encryption, uh, homomorphic encryption for like unstructured data and like whatever, that all of this could ever be developed in a way that'll be sufficient to prevent our privacy concerns from arising in this case. And of course, I don't know the answer to that technological question. But you might think artists, for example, have a right to privacy of some kind, and music should fall under this kind of thing. I think that's a reasonable first step. I don't think that kind of justification makes very much sense when you think about the data about, say, you and I sitting on servers owned by Meta, right? They don't have a right to privacy that others not access that data. If anything, maybe you and I do, and we need to figure out that problem. But if we're already to the point where it's sitting on the servers and being used by Meta, right, that strikes me as different. So I don't think they could appeal to the same kind of, I think, privacy concern that someone who's unhappy or just doesn't want to share what they've been doing in their free time might be, you know, entitled to exclude. So that's just to say, there might be a different basis for exclusion there namely privacy. A different point, which is made, I think, forcefully by a philosopher named Brian Quick, is that a justification for exclusion in cases of intellectual property is often to secure another right, namely the right to profit. So what you might need is the right to exclusive manufacture, right? or the right to exclude in order to ensure that I make money off of my music. Now, people, I I should note really quickly, 
that may, so I think the idea here is conventional. It's sort of like, this is the best way for us to try and do this. It's not obvious that applies in the case of say Meta or Alphabet in the same way they make plenty of money off of the advertising. And the proposal here is there's other ways you might sort of force them to sell some of the data. They'd be making a profit in that way. And notice actually that's not that different than when musicians, in fact, though voluntarily upload music to iTunes. They're not, they don't have much control over excluding the, the way the music gets handed out to various individuals, they can still exclude it from, say, being used in a movie or something like that. But, you know, they can't actually exclude particular individuals from downloading the music at the relevant price. So the proposal is not supposed to actually be that exotic. Yeah. Because what's interesting is to talk about the music case is that now uh, I was recently reading an article about sort of all these lawsuits now of musicians or estates from of musicians who have passed away, but their families, their estates suing newer musicians for like interpolations or, you know, things like that. And like what's, you know, a lot of the debates around this is sort of like people sort of starting to, it's more than just like a copyright of a song, but a copyright of like a chord progression, let's say, or a certain rhythm or something. And, you you know, where maybe that kind of thing should not be, uh, you know, able to be exclusionary because or have a right to exclude excludability because, you know, it's something broader. It's music. It's really kind of like the language of music that everybody should be able to play with. But then how do you draw those boundaries between the sort of something that somebody created that they should have a right to profit, right to exclude, exclude and then right to profit kind of connected together versus, you know, someone being able to it's I guess it's a similar thing when you talk about sort of satire and parody, things like that. Um, I think these are more just fine grained cases where it shows that, yes, this is very difficult and why you, you couldn't necessarily, you know, totally codify everything to the most minutest detail. But I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's basically right. I mean, at the end of the day, that's a, that's sort of exactly what I'm saying is that in any of these cases, I, you know, I I think even if you think, say, a right to use and profit may be a sort of natural right, a right that one just has in virtue of some kind of activity they engage in, morally speaking, and it doesn't come from uh, some, you know, other kind of authority. The claim here is at least in the case of non-rivalrous goods, though, or goods that are fairly non-rivalrous, the right to exclude the justification for that isn't natural. That something like scarcity is required in order to get that right off the ground. I I might even, if you push me, go to bat and say it's always a conventional right, no matter what, the right to exclude. It's a kind of useful tool for ensuring people's other rights are in fact maintained. I think that's a sort of more plausible theory, in part because of all the cases you're mentioning. When you look out at the wide variety of disputes people have, it becomes, I think, quite difficult to see a single moral principle that would very easily demarcate which cases the natural right to exclude exists in and which ones it doesn't. I think to some degree, it might be up to us. It may be political. And so in part, what I'm saying is the standard ways in which people politically defend the right to exclude don't work out obviously as well in this case. That's compatible with it working out in other kinds of cases, I think. And it may, and it, I mean, you know, and I, I should say for, for various kinds of qualifications I try to be sensitive to, it may turn out that some firms that collect large amounts of behavioral data and use it, they, it may be better to recognize a conventional right in those cases. Now, we would need a, a kind of more robust, nice, clean set of laws in order to distinguish what these are exactly. but. That's sort of the big picture is if you want a clear fundamental principle, you're unlikely to find one. No, that's great. Yeah. And so get to so to get to the other kind of concern is like the I think what I was concerned with is also the sort of open access. But I think that, you know, the idea because because open data is, a, you know, an increasing the idea of data commons. These are increasingly popular ideas. But yeah, so but to the extent that people are concerned with something, you know, kind of not just privacy, which I think is also very valid and, and a, a big concern, because the other thing is, I think, for people to be comfortable using and be engaging with, you know, technologies that will be data that will share as you want to know that, you know, your privacy isn't going to be violated. 
yeah, I'm thinking I'm thinking currently like people feeling like they need to delete all their, you know, period tracking apps because of the Dobbs decision, for example. So th- these would be, you know, obviously those types of concerns. But then also this idea of, OK, if data can be used and accessed by more actors, then are there going to be more actors creating the types of manipulative technologies, algorithmic targeting, artificial intelligence that we are concerned about? Um, and, you know, kind of what are the knockoff, you know, knock on implications, effects of sort of expanding access to data? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so maybe to just say something in general. Yeah, so I, in a way, part of the suggestion here, so we start off in this kind of antitrust landscape, right? And so one thing I was trying to do was explain what it might be about power and its relationship to competition, markets, property rights that might look especially objectionable. And so I'm locating this in a kind of particular kind of property right that I, it's not clear to me the these firms are entitled to. And then that, that becomes an objectionable form of power. If they don't have the right, then the fact they have the power is is prima facie objectionable. Okay. So then there's a question of like, you know, I think part of what your question is getting at is like, come on, isn't there like a positive vision sort of like coming out here? Like, you're, you know, this isn't just you trying to make some extra philosophical sense out of an obscure antitrust worry. You've got an agenda, don't you? Right? I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So broadly speaking, I, I, you know, I see the advantages of having a more sort of open data scheme thinking of at least rights to data. So I, to maybe make, try and make this clear, rights to data as similar to rights to I'm interested in the proposal that rights to data, property like rights to data, should function somewhat analogously to the way rights function in cases of common pool resource management, so commons management. Uh, I want to be careful to say that it's not going to be obviously the case that common pool resources and data have the same exact structure. Often, you know, fisheries, for example, might be highly rivalrous. So that wouldn't quite make sense. Yeah, exactly. I was actually, you know, I actually had prepared a question about that. So I'm glad you're talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But there are sort of questions about access rights that pop up and how to democratically organize access rights how that should be done, you know, and there's questions maybe about how a firm should be compensated for, say, you know, improving a commons or something like that, which say a community uh, relies upon. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot to unpack there. And there's kind of, yeah, I think it's fair to say, you know, there's something of an agenda lurking here. Uh, in a different direction that doesn't have entirely to do with antitrust. It's this possibility that something like open data, you know, common, a data commons strikes me as an interesting and compelling idea. Now, I say this in part because I think that there are so many benefits to be gained from this, namely in innovation. However, there's another thing which is related to the antitrust concerns, which was, I think this will limit the power that some of these firms have that then we can work, you know, we might worry about, especially how much these firms are running our lives, how much these firms are able to create uh, very lucrative, exclusive partnerships with government agencies in ways that others won't be able to if they more or less have a monopoly on behavioral data of a very useful sort. So I think of this as both a tool for innovation and a a tool for potentially restricting the power of firms, and we might worry about that kind of thing. So that's there is something there that I find attractive. Now, there are a n- long list of things one should be prepared to be worried about here. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to be prepared to be worried. I, I was born ready, baby. <laughs> so yeah, so absolutely. Privacy is one of them. Okay, we already have worries about, I think, for a lack of a a better phrase in a way, or maybe it's, there's, you know, there's nothing to regret here. This is a perfectly good phrase. The lack of caution that so many firms display in developing their AI or deploying it in particular use cases is astonishing. Even, even nonprofits, right? So there's, there's a somewhat prominent case from a few months ago now of an eating disorder hotline 
which was using a chat bot that it turned out was encouraging people. Well, encouraging might be the wrong word. It was certainly doing more than enabling people's eating disorders, and they had to shut this bot down. I think the fact of the matter is due to people wanting, you know, the kind of uh, advantage you get by entering a market first or by doing something first or other kinds of pressures to cut costs or the difficult labor market, so on and so forth, right? There might be all kinds of pressures. It's really tempting to jump in and use some of these technologies, become an early adopter of them. And frankly, it's it's just not clear we should be yet doing that for many, many application cases. It, you know, there's even uh, in the last couple of days, there's been some concern over uh, a study, um, I think coming out of Stanford about whether chat GPT, the underlying model is somehow changed. Oh, that it's like getting better. It's getting worse because of the it is. I, yeah, I, oh, I, I shouldn't speak to because I should look at the, into this. But it, is it something like having to do with like a feedback loop effect where as it gets more information, it, it sort of keeps learning, but then it kind of learns itself into a a wall or something? I don't know. It's like, yeah, I, I think it's it's a little bit complicated. So it looks it, for, just for what it's worth, it's the study is actually somewhat controversial. The, so the degree to which it demonstrates something we should be immediately worried about. I will say that as far as I can tell what people who think the study maybe overstates its conclusions, there's some people who think that, but some of those people think nevertheless that the kind of ironic lack in transparency that open AI has and how this algorithm is sort of working and being updated um, should cause us to lose some amount of trust in immediately using it to develop use cases. So if you wanted to develop some piece of software, but the underlying sort of engine of the thing is altering in slightly bizarre ways, then maybe we shouldn't trust it. Interestingly, insofar as you buy the study, chat GPT 3.5 rather than 4 was doing better than 4. Anyway, so to some degree, it seems to me it's early days and that there's all of these incentives to not proceed with caution. And we really ought to be proceeding with caution in these kinds of cases in general. So I think that's true. And maybe making all of this stuff available that may not remove all of the kinds of incentives people have to try and get novel use cases. So you're just going to see a proliferation of incautious uses. That's, that's a very serious worry. I, you know, I think at this point, if someone told you they knew exactly how to minimize that risk, they would, you know, you shouldn't believe them. Yeah. And that's still something that we already, like you said, you, I mean, you can compare it to the current situation. So in the current situation is already kind of dealing with, I would say, over eager or zealous implementations of technologies that in ways that are it's actually interesting because i think you know i do have priors on some of this but at the same time i think from a even if you think that ai you know these you know llm technologies that all these things are great and that they're going to improve our productivity and they're not going to be like they, we should kind of be excited about the possibilities of what it will enable human beings to do. Even if you have like that most optimistic view, you still, I would say, should still be almost those people I would think should be even more concerned about some of these implementations because if you if you like use I'm just like imagining like a because you know we have the the writer's strike and the actor's strike right now and they're concerned with AI. And I'm just imagining like you created an AI you know, a TV show or something, and it was just bad. Like, who would want? To, which, like, I honestly think it probably would be. But you know, maybe I'm wrong. But if, but again, if you just if you use something before it's really actually that good, people are just gonna th never buy it again. You know, like, why would they buy into it? Why would they trust it? Why would they? You know, so I, I do think there's sort of even those who are excited who are optimistic, um, I think have an interest in kind of being concerned with how cautious people are in terms of releasing them and using them more widely, things like that, and, and integrating them into our economy in various ways. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think it's it's complex, of course, because there, there's a there's going to turn out to be like a, a bizarre distribution of responsibility in many cases, right? So open AI is not themselves are not themselves developing many of the use cases. Oh, and they can just say, well, you know, we didn't do it. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 And to some extent, you know, they, they might've been like, look, if the, if the, you know, I don't know that this was this particular bot was chat GPT. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think it was, um, but I may be misremembering, but for the, you know, the eating disorder, but you know, they might've said, if you called us, we would have said, no, don't do that. You know? Um, and they might be right. They might've said that that may be entirely genuine, but this kind of separation there is, you know, it, it it may be the right way to do things. I'm not sure, but it does seem to, you know, I think what we're facing is something like a collective action problem to some degree here. And, you know, it's unclear, you know, what to do about that fact. It's not clear which actors are blameworthy. We can say, of course, that the hotline should have proceeded with more caution than they in fact did. But I think the worry is bigger than just a few people not proceeding with the caution. Thing. Yeah. And, and two, I mean, I, I think I really loved our conversation for the reason of, you know, we really did zero in on data. Um, and like you started out, like there are people concerned with AI, with the algorithmic bias, but then there's also these sort of data issues that we're going to focus on. Um, but yeah, I think I'm glad that we kind of get got back into the AI um, machine learning and, and implementation of these technologies because they are ultimately, you know, based on data, uh, trained by trained on data. So, you know, even if something is implemented using the resources offered in open access by another organization, you know, it's it is, again, a sort of network responsibility, sort of relational aspect where, you know, OK, yes, one is not responsible for a particular use case or something in, in a certain situation. And yet was the use, the use case being based on certain faulty data, let's say, or, you know, I- any kind of number of decisions that are made at the, you know, foundation can be ultimately um, still part of the kind of problems that are, are seen. So, um, and this is why I would also say, I mean, I guess one, because one, one, Discussion could be, you know, liability is the solution to these concerns. But then I would, I, I mean, you know, we're not lawyers, so I'm not going to pretend like we are. But I think, you know, we can already kind of see how do you actually apply, you know, how do you actually sort out liability in some of these kind of relational ex- examples, basically, networked examples. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I, the liability point is likely inevitable. I mean, people are going to be sued for incautious uses of these technologies. You know, I suspect we'll see plenty of that in the short term. You know, who who knows in the long term? And then, you know, I guess to your earlier point, that's exactly right. I mean, it's not just a, you know, who, you know, no one's ever going to buy it again if the product looks bad. If firms sit there and look at like the chance that something's going to go haywire with this, they're going to say, you know, why take on that cost? Why do that? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's, I think the point here maybe is not to like doomsay exactly. It's to recognize, I think, more the reality of the situation is that I think the optimism should be at least in the short term tempered. You know, maybe that's a bit funny for a philosopher who just said, you know, yeah, we should have some kind of open data scheme to say. No, I think that that shows, I think that we always have to balance out the optimism because I think in order to kind of envision a better situation, you have to have some amount of optimism and a willingness to kind of have a commitment to a a potential alternative, right? But I think also the way that you develop those thoughts are going to have to be rooted in like a very clear kind of critique of the way things are or also, you know, the type of concerns that you're trying to avoid when you're when you're thinking about the alternatives, you know. Yeah, I I think I do think with technology and one of the difficulties is that sort of part of the issue with the AI debates is also, you know, predictive analytics and a lot of claims of we're going to use this data in in ways to be able to have predictability. Um, there's a, you know, an excellent paper on AI fallibility. Um, and that basically you know, the argument for those who are concerned with like algorithmic discrimination, various ethical issues in AI is that actually we already have all these legal regimes around fraud and kind of consumer protection concerns. And that actually a lot of these technologies, let's say something like predictive policing type of technologies, they promise something that they just inherently can't 
deliver or, you know, in specific ways, it fails to meet some expectations. And so you don't really even need to have fundamentally new ways of approaching the problems. Or you, and you also don't necessarily need to get into the ethical issues. You can just get into the kind of legal frameworks we already have. But that does kind of require, I don't know, I, I think that the more knowledge you have of how the technologies work, the easier it would be to kind of rely on that framework. And I think the difficulty is that not a lot of people um, totally know how, how these systems work. Right, certainly. I mean, there's, you know, and you, you raised something interesting there, which is that I think one one question I've gotten a lot, and I know many of my colleagues have gotten a lot, is like, philosophically speaking, is there really anything new here? You know, we're sort of worried it, worried about all of this in a new way, uh, socially speaking. But, you know, when you talk about things like predictive policing technologies and things like that, it's like, isn't isn't this, didn't we always have problems with versions of statistical discrimination, didn't we, you know, wasn't this always already an issue? Okay, we've taken a, we've taken like an immediate human decider on some issue out of the equation. But, you know, it's not clear, especially given where the data comes from, why those same biases, we shouldn't think are just continuing to emerge. Like what, what is, you know, What's the new problem exactly? We always we were always aware of this. I mean, I I think one of the things I find interesting about some of the data side of things is that when you're thinking about the way data as a is a kind of you know it's among the most like potentially productive behavioral data is among among the most potentially productive and yet non rivalrous goods we've ever seen. So I think there is something novel there. I also think that. In part, what the novelty might be in the case of deploying various algorithms and various kinds of use cases, what the novel problem is, you know, obviously we should be concerned about whether they're producing racist outcomes, right? Um, Not just occasionally people are like, well, are they less racist than human beings? Well, even if it turns out that they are, it would be great if we could just get rid of the racism thing altogether, wouldn't it? But is, I, I think... I think there's more to be said here about sort of our relationship to technology socially than, you know, the kind of overly dismissive worry that there's nothing new here lets on. What exactly those things are, how to say them, how exactly this functions politically, I'm I'm, I'm not sure. No, I mean, I think that that's why, I mean, I think it's an exciting time in the sense that I think a lot of people want to be talking about it. And I think that it's something that you know, academics have stuff to say from various disciplines, but also, you know, ordinary people. I, I'm honestly, I don't know. I feel like I don't get to have as many conversations with strangers as before the pandemic, but I'm always struck by how it just feels to me. And I, again, I guess it's just sort of because of what I do or talk about, but every, I think everybody's thinking about these issues, like the way that technology fits into our lives and what does the future hold? I mean, AI, I, I've, I've often, I don't know how to do this more on the podcast, but sometimes I really think that when we talk about AI, you kind of sometimes have to think about, well, what is this person, what they're saying about AI, what does it reveal about the way they think about like human intelligence, about society, about individuals? And yeah, I think that that we, you know, so there's so many kind of registers in which we can like be thinking about and talking about these issues that makes them so open ended in a way. I feel like it's a it's a very uh, political theorist point. I feel like every time I'm in a uh, seminar room with political theorists, uh, someone always asks, what what is this person's, you know, political theory tell us about their view of human nature yeah. or something like that? No, that's uh, true. Yeah, that's true. It, it's it's that, that's not a, it's it, <laughs> it's a totally uh, it's a totally interesting and wonderful uh, question. Uh, I never think to ask it, but maybe <laughs> I think maybe what I was saying just a moment ago is that I I should think to ask it and I'd have a better reply to those kinds of reductive worries. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that it takes a lot of different perspectives to kind of get a, a total view of a question or a problem, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us and having this great conversation. It was lovely to talk to you as always. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank you so much.
Well, our conversation today and, and Jimmy's work in general is engaging with really popular debates about antitrust, specifically concerning technology companies like Amazon, Alphabet, and Meta. I'm going to focus my comments on the broader philosophical arguments that Jimmy makes. So on the one side of this debate, we have the consumer welfare standard, which is a legal doctrine that states a business's actions should only be subject to government antitrust action if this business's actions result in consumers paying more for a good or service. And in recent years, the new Brandeisian movement has challenged this principle on the basis that it doesn't capture the power exercised by many technology companies, particularly when they are free to users. Now, Jimmy's work is setting to setting out to outline the normative vision underpinning this challenge to the consumer welfare standard. And he does so by drawing on both the neo-republicanism of philosophers Philip Pettit and Gerald Gauss, including Republican conceptions of market morality. So Jimmy and I are not lawyers, so that is why this conversation will focus more on these philosophical underpinnings. And the broader point that I want to underscore here is that debating issues around market processes also entail thinking critically about the private property rights underpinning, the property regimes underpinning these processes, the political economy. And that's something that we're interested in talking about here at this podcast and at the Hayek program more generally. And so whenever we are thinking about these questions, even when people argue that property rights are traceable to something natural that we're born with, a natural right, this is a political question And it's a question that we should subject to critique, to critical thinking that needs to be justified to ourselves and to each other, importantly, as a shared political community who's subject to these regimes. And so diving into Jimmy's arguments specifically and giving us a little summary here about what we talked about today, I wanted to emphasize this neo-Republican conception of uh, that Jimmy is working with here. So this is very different from what we call the Republican Party in the U.S. It's also different from another philosophical conception of republicanism or classical republicanism, which emphasizes the civic virtues required for political life. Rather, Jimmy's working with a neo-Republican tradition that's focused on understanding liberty in terms of non-domination or minimizing the subjection of individuals to arbitrary power. So, for example, When we talk about political institutions, the rule of law and democracy can be valuable insofar as it minimizes the extent to which individuals are subject to the arbitrary discretions of rulers. At the same time, neo-Republicans are sensitive to the way people can be unjustly exposed to arbitrary power in private spheres, like in the employment context, uh, the power of employers, but also in the family context, being subject to the arbitrary power of family members. In his work, Jimmy puts this in terms of arguing that non-domination is this normative moral ideal that is relevant to these debates, especially to the new Brandeisian challenge to the consumer welfare standard. And that specifically, non-domination means that power ought not to be arbitrary. And so power should be forced to track the legitimate interests of whoever is subject to such power. So what does this all this have to do with technology, digital political economy? Jimmy's work starts with the worry that the way that firms like Alphabet and Meta and Amazon profit from big data that they derive from users seems intuitively to be a kind of theft. And now philosophy is beyond just sorting out these institutions, but this can be a starting point from which we can question and think more critically about the assumptions that we are working with, and then also how ought we should um, change or adjust the way we think about our economic relations. So for example, do these platforms owe anything to their users that are producing the data? This data is after all produced in a relational manner by not only the platforms, but also the users. And this leads naturally to thinking about property rights and the kind of ethical principles that we expect markets to rely on or cultivate. So again, the issues here are normative and philosophical, not necessarily legal. That We may argue for changes to legal regimes that are in line with normative concerns. So property rights, as Jimmy talked about, are a bundle of many different rights. 
And so the right to use or the right to profit can be different from the right to exclude or the right to sell. And we have all kinds of contractual relationships where we see these differentiated rights at play. Now, when thinking about how property rights as they apply to data, Jimmy drew our attention to the relational nature of data, that it is produced not only by firms, but by users, and that the data I provide, for example, provides information about people that I have all sorts of social ties to, online and off. Now, the extent to which firms retain a right to exclude people from accessing data, that can lead to a lot of different concerns. So Jimmy and I talked about concerns like rent-seeking, and this is in line with the public choice theory that political economists in the Virginia School at the Mercatus Center and at the Hayek program are working with. And so this public choice critique would say that to the extent that firms retain this right to exclude, they can leverage their data into partnerships with the government over and above other people and individuals included. We might be concerned not only by what the companies can do with data, but what they can enable government to do by accessing our data. Uh, I think back to that episode that we had on surveillance with Christopher Coyne. I just want to flag here that these concerns, while they, uh, like I said, are in line with a 20th century school of political economic thought, public choice theory, they also have precedents going back all the way to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and his critique of mercantilism, which is related to the way that merchants could capture the state and the political rulemaking in important ways and in detrimental ways to all of the public. Jimmy's neo-Republican approach is especially interested in this idea that legal regimes should be forced to track the interests of the people. When we're thinking about the provision of particular goods, it can be easy to see how when a good is rivalrous, like the apple that Jimmy gave the example of, it means that that good cannot be consumed by more than one person without that consumption diminishing the ability of others to consume. But data is non-rivalrous, and here's where these assumptions about property rights and who holds them can come into question, right? Because data can be used by multiple parties at the same time. So it's not clear that the right to use requires that user to have a right to exclude other users. And so according to Jimmy, open access to data could increase everyone's benefits. It also doesn't preclude rights to profit. Again, data is relational, so Jimmy's arguing that this doesn't mean we have to deny the work that platforms do in facilitating data creation in the first place. Rather, it just helps us reconsider the role that other individuals play in this data production. As Jimmy underscored, however, the the current property rights regime in the digital political economy prevents innovative uses of data by the people who create the data, who are part of this production. By excluding users from potential uses of their data, or by preventing them from allowing researchers to use their data, firms are, to some degree, exercising arbitrary power, according to Jimmy's neo-Republican framework. I think one thing to think about here is that maybe this conversation is going way beyond the debates about antitrust, because we're thinking more deeply about the property rights regimes that govern data. And this would mean rulemaking that is applicable to all sorts of actors, not just the current dominant technology companies. Because again, there is a fair public choice critique of the ways that companies can rent, seek, and pursue regulations that will further entrench their power, as opposed to actually empowering individual users in a universal way. You might not be persuaded by our conversation, and I want to underscore that that's okay. What I do want to get across is that it's important to consider the normative justifications we rely on when we talk about concepts as fundamental as property rights. Whatever frameworks we are using when we justify property rights, are these frameworks and these conversations are inherently political. And as a result, it's a conversation that requires not just thinking about law or even legal traditions, but other moral and ethical values and principles as well as political philosophy as well. Um, And both all these different concepts that we are already working with and we're already practicing in the world and also values and principles to which we aspire that we're trying to realize. Toward the end, I wanna note that thinking about the broader vision that Jimmy's outlining and that he is working in his research is this notion of open data and data comments. So these concepts are still concerned with 
things like anonymizing data and other privacy-oriented practices, but they're also really emphasizing the priority that people could work with their data or enable others to use their data to all sorts of beneficial purposes, rather than being exclusively held by private companies. Relevant to these conversations is the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who's governing the commons, challenged this notion of a tragedy of the commons by exploring how all sorts of communities around the world successfully collectively self-governed common pool resources. Now, common pool resources like fisheries, which we talked briefly about, are different from data because those are rivalrous. They are subtractable in a way that data consumption is not. But these communities still self-governed using a variety of institutions, both formal and informal. And consequently, Eleanor Ostrom's work is an inspiration for many people working in open data and thinking about ways of adapting, using, and governing open data. In other words, Eleanor Ostrom's work points us toward alternative property regimes that we could work with when we're thinking about the digital political economy. Thanks for joining us and thinking about these deep philosophical questions. I'm really excited to keep diving into these issues with our future guests and with you in future episodes. Thanks so much for listening. Till next time.